then this is the last day of uh, the lecture. And uh, I'm going to uh, cover today uh, oxide interfaces, uh, which is uh, um, currently is uh, one of the most one of the most, most exciting topic in the uh, oxide interface, oxide systems. And uh, um, so then after that, I'll talk about some more practical, uh, like a thin film acquisition and, and sputtering and evaporation and and then uh, I think the afternoon um, we have some more discussion about that. So this field, oxide interfaces, is uh, um, actually started around 2004. Um, one group in, in Japan and then uh, published a paper about the striking uh, the interface phenomena in oxide uh, between the two band insulators. And then since then, I think this is uh, um, one of the uh, very important scientific and then uh, technologically important area and in the in the oxide field. Um, so I'd like to talk just a general. This interface is uh, considered as a new material. So if you consider semiconductors and the uh, semiconductor any semiconductor device. You do not use a semiconductor as a bulk material itself. Semiconductor, any semiconductor you, you can think of, like simply PN junctions. PN junction, P type semiconductor, N type semiconductor. And when you have a junction forms, and it forms a, um, the depletion region, and that they creating a rectifying circuit and PN junction, or metal and semiconductor forms. Schottky barriers, and then you also make a diode, and then uh, so this is all very important interfacial phenomena, and then many important devices and sciences. But fundamental difference between the oxide interfaces and the semiconductor interfaces, and uh, one of the fundamental difference is semiconductor interface is much broader uh, when you have a depletion region forms length scale interface uh, much longer than and the oxide interface which is uh, one or two or few atomic layer and then all the phenomena is confined and very very small length scale and more importantly and then uh, in, in oxides is a strong electron correlation and then and creating some interesting physics and then and phenomena and uh, that's why I think uh, this fundamental uh, differences and uh, science is, uh, is really, really exciting. So let me just to talk about this oxide interfaces. And then the first demonstration by uh, Harold Wang, and he is now at Stanford. He was at, at the time in Japan in Tokyo University. And uh, the basic idea he had, and these two are about single crystal of lanthanum aluminate and the strontium titanate. As you know, the strontium titanate, before we realized strontium titanate is an important substrate for high TC superconductors and or other types of uh, like substrate for the growth of thin, thin films. And this one has been used like a gemstone. I know that in India, a lot of places, and then has a lot of important uh, gemstones, like even diamonds and ruby and sapphires and all these things, but strontium titanate is, uh, is a gemstone. And uh, so you can see that when you cut it, you can see nice, uh, nice uh, the, uh, glowing and crystals. And then this is the bowl of lanthanum aluminate. And lanthanum aluminate is colored a little bit yellowish. And then both are like a band insulator. And then band gave up this like a 3.5 EV band insulator. And this was like a 5 EV of a lens. So both are complete insulator and without doping or anything, it's, it's complete insulator. But the, when you create some interface uh, between those two band insulator, some striking phenomena has happened at the interface. And uh, so one of the interesting uh, original observation was, <coughs> as I said in the beginning of my first lecture, all the perovskite structure, okay, perovskite structure of AbO3 structure. On the AbO3 
one zero zero plane, you have a two different types of surface that you can have. The first type of surface is here TiO2 surface and the strontium oxide surface. And TiO2, you can think about Ti is plus four, the valence state plus four, oxygen minus two. So Ti1 or Ti, oxygen, two oxygen, and then it's a, electrically is, is a neutral, the charge neutral. So TiO2 neutral, strontium plus two and oxygen minus two. So it's a strontium O that's also charge neutral. So that means you can have any surface of strontium titan in one zero the surface, it can be charge neutral. Okay? So that's what you call this is a nonpolar surface. Okay, so it's a nonpolar. But when you create this one, it's one 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 surface. Okay. The one 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 surface, I'll talk about that later. Then one 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 surface is different surface atomic configuration and that's no longer charge neutral in the surface. A three-dimensional bulk state is strontium-1, that's a minus 2, a plus 2, and then titanium plus 4, the total charge is plus 6. And oxygen-3 oxygen minus 2, so they're minus 6. So a bulk state is charge neutral. And all the bulk states charge neutral, but I think the surface state is, is some materials is no longer charge neutral, and depending on which surface plane you're talking about. And then, uh, so what they did is, is they actually, maybe they discovered first time, intention was not the discovery of 2D electron gas, but they have striking result. When you grow this band insulator, lanthanum aluminate, on top of strontium titanate, specific atomic configuration. So you grow here, start with the titanium oxide termination here, okay, start with TiO2 termination, and then zero means a charge neutral. And then TiO2 is a B site, okay, B site material. The next layer, the lanthanum eliminate, lanthanum is the A site. So that means stacking sequence of this uh, perovskite is always follows A site, B site, A site, B site, no matter it is a different material or so same material, and you always follow the AB, AB stacking sequence. So you have a lanthanum next layer, like a strontium titanate, clear TiO2 termination. Next layer should be lanthanum oxide termination. But lanthanum oxide is a lanthanum is rarest, stable, more stable atomic arrangement is plus three. Oxygen is a minus two. So that means this one is no longer charge neutral. It's, it's plus one net charge of that atomic plane is plus one. And the next layer, aluminum oxide, AlO2, aluminum plus three, oxygen minus two. So that means that your net charge is minus one. Okay, so do you understand this one? So, so that means charge here, zero, 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 zero all the time, on the strontium titanate, and become here, is plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. It, it is like a, that creating, this kind of net charge is no longer zero. This is what we call polar material, polar surface. Okay. So the polar and non-polar and having contact, and then especially when you have this polar, non-polar created, and it creating polar catastrophe. I'll talk about that later. Okay. So potential build up, and then it has to some point, it's no longer support the polar, the polar field, then the electron has to come from the subsurface and to compensate this. So that is prediction of this, and then it's a one possible configuration is this. Another configuration is start with a strontium oxide rather than TiO2, then strontium oxide first, Next layer should be aluminum oxide, okay? So that means you have minus one, plus one, minus one, and you have a different interface of phenomena, okay? So I'll go more details about the, this electronic reconstruction, but when they observed, measured, the make a like this, they found that 
they have a very highly conducting two-dimensional electron gas and they carry a concentration order of 10 to the, um, I think 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 and sheet carrier density. It is quite high carrier density compared to some of the gallium, gallium nitride or semiconductor to the electron gas, a very high carrier concentration. And mobility is at low temperature is high. And room temperature is not very high because uh, if the uh, uh, electron phonon interaction is very strong. And uh, but and this one is insulated. Okay? So even same type of material, lanthanum laminate on top of strontium titanate, one way is very highly conducting, one way is completely insulating. It's just the, those two phenomena is very striking. And then, uh, so why this thing happened? And then, so maybe they study the curiosity why that happened. And then later, okay, maybe we realize that 2D electron gas is somehow very useful. Later, and Johann Menhart's group at, uh, at uh, Max Planck Institute. And then um, they actually measure this interesting phenomena when you grow lanthanum aluminate and then like a layer by layer make a one layer, two layer, three layer, four layer, they increase the thickness of the strontium uh, lanthanum aluminate, like how many unit cells, okay? On top of the TiO determinate surface, they grow number of unit cells and increase it, and below, below three unit cell, four unit cell, and one, two, three unit cell, and that's insulated, okay? But suddenly, once you pass the uh, three unit cell, then goes jump to very highly conducting to the electron gas, and this conductivity, and then doesn't change as a function of thickness of the lanthanum aluminate. Okay, so that means is uh, number one is a carry sheet, sheet resistance or conduct sheet conductance is constant as a function of thickness of the LAO lanthanum aluminate which means here it forms a two-dimensional characteristics of the carriers and then something happens below or above three unit cell or four unit cell which is we call critical thickness of the two electron gas phenomenon. So why that happen? So this is the actual proposed and mechanism. I think this is something is, is uh, we call polar catastrophe electronic reconstruction and then you can see that is this non-polar uh, zero 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 then you start minus one uh, plus one minus one plus one and then you have electric field and potential actually build up okay and you potential build up and then in order to a certain point and the electron has to come from this top surface to the interface because initially this and then this one coming from the top surface to interface and then potential is actually reduced. Okay? So that is mechanism we call electronic reconstruction and then uh, why you have uh, this kind of critical thickness this critical thickness based on direct constant of this and based on this kind of uh, potential, or how much potential build up, and this one is consistent with the actual theoretical ca theoretical prediction or theoretical calculation, is roughly four unit cell, and then electron has to come from time interface. Okay, so that is fundamental mechanism for for this. But some other people, some other groups propose different mechanism, like a more extrinsic mechanism maybe creating at the interface oxygen vacancies it plays a role. Some people propose that inner diffusion is another extreme factor. But in generally, it is so well accepted and the mechanism for 2D electron gas. Okay? So, so that is something very interesting. You can have the band diagram. It's 3.5 EV, roughly the 5 EV. And then you have electron gas forms near the interface. But the question is, why this one does not form any conducting interface? 
based on based on this model and this interface should form two dimensional whole gas okay? because of the, the opposite of charge so you have this interface expected to the electron gas and to the whole gas but this one is not forming to the whole gas and I'll talk about that later our recent paper and then we have a direct observation and demonstration of 2D whole gas and oxide interfaces and then we understood why people could not observe these 2D whole gas over the last 14 years. Okay, at discovery of 2004, an original paper 2004, and people tried to make 2D whole gas but it's not really worked out. But we realized that there's an important mechanism to prevent 2D whole gas, but we are able to demonstrate it. So, so having a characteristic of 2D electron gas here, the concentration is, is half electron per unit cell. The theoretical actual value of maximum number is half electron per unit cell based on the electron, electron deconstruction model. And that's roughly, charge in sheet carriers is roughly 3 times 10 to the 14 per square centimeter. And, but that is, real measurement is, is always lower than this. Maybe some other carriers, not it's right, the mobile carriers. And then distribution of this range of 1 to 7 nanometer, but we actually measure spatial distribution of the 2D electron gas by inline holography. I'll show you with TM based technique, I'll show you actual spatial distribution of 2D electron gas, and quantitatively, we know what's the number and also spatial distribution what is the depth length, length scale of spread of this. It's roughly one or two nanometers, very, very well confined and then near the interface. And low temperature mobility is high, but room temperature mobility roughly 5 to 10. It's very, very small, okay? Because uh, that's a strong phonon and uh, interaction. And then more importantly, this 2D electron gas is not only conducting, and that is superconductivity. And then this superconductivity is, can be tuned by electric field or gating. And that's what is a few papers and the high profile papers of a superconductivity of a 2D electron gas. And also, people observe the magnetism, ferromagnetism in, in 2D electron, uh, electron system. And then they're using squid, scanning squid magnetometers. And then they measure the spatial exactly where it's a magnet. And also they can tune the gating and ferromagnetism they can tune. So functionality wise, superconductivity to the electron of the ferromagnetism, but this one can be switchable by, by many different ways. And by electric field and by strain, and then you have even you can use AFM tips, nanowires, you can write and you can be configurable and then device. So you can make, so here, tunable to the electron gas, and then they have some papers about three unit cell is insulating, above three unit cell conducting, so they can make this one by applying the gate voltage, like a back gating of the field. You can on and off, insulating and conducting, you can make those things, okay? So that means this is, can be switched and the switch on and off because you see there could be low critical thickness, above critical thickness metal insulator transition. But you can do those kind of cross, very close to metal insulator transition, and you can tune it by electric field. Okay, so that's a, something really exciting. And then the more interesting thing is we we are able to integrate integrate this to the electron gas on silicon. So this is a silicon wafer, and then grow strontium titanate. This is grown by MBE. Then we grow LA on top, and clearly we have uh, some dislocations because the strontium titanate layer is very thick. And then when you grow, you still be able to see lanthanum oxide and titanium oxide. You can make a very well defined an uh, interface. This is actually made single TiO determinated strontium titanium silicon, then you go at AO. But before you do that, 
we did some special heat treatment to reduce the, uh, the defect density. Because when you grow, you have a lot of dislocations. And because the lattice mismatch is quite big, and when you honeer it, it's a moire fringes. You can see the moire fringes, it shows very fine and grain domain structures, but after annealing, you can see the much less defects there. So by doing so, and we are able to get similar to the electron's behavior at room temperature. So, so in here, the physics point of view is interesting, but potentially some device point of view is very interesting. For example, they're using the AFM, the AFM tip, and biasing this AFM tip is positive voltage. And when you do positive voltage, and then you can have a creating here to the electron gas, it become metallic wire, nanowire. <coughs> this wire width is roughly a few nanometers. A very, very narrow nanowires you can do. You can also cross the, the opposite of the voltage, and then cross this way, you can make it insulating wire. Okay. Once you write, you can erase. So basically, this is what you call reconfigurable electronics, reconfigurable nanoelectronics. So that means, you know that the uh, kids here, I don't know you guys play this one, it's an aluminum powder in the, in, the, in the box like that. You shake it, and you have a two knobs, and then you, you control the knobs, and then draw something, then you shake it again, and then you draw again. What do you call name? Okay, that's a you can sketch. I mean, you can you can sketch fan, and then you can you can sketch it by using aluminum powder, and this is similar. You can actually erase. You can write, erase, write. Is a you can make some different types of devices, and be configurable. Most of the device once you grow, make it you fix their position, but you can make this one is reconfigurable. But the functionality of these uh, nano wires when you create this one. You can make a superconductivity, magnetism, you can have different functionality. And that's why I think that this, uh, especially Jeremy Levy and, at the University of Pittsburgh, and they have done a lot of interesting work. It can be a photo detectors, and then you can make a ferromagnetism, and then even interesting um, the uh, superconductivity. Um, I think it's, it's, it's quite exciting, and then it is potentially um, the nanoelectronics point of view. So I'm going to show you something. It is a technique. Really, you can actually see that to the electron gas. Okay. So before I go some more physics, and then I collaborate with this TM expert group. One of the very curious thing is so far demonstration of to the electron gas based on transport measurement. Okay, electrical transport measurement. And then when you measure transport. <coughs> And then you measure only mobile carriers, okay? The mobile carriers and hall measurement. You measure the what the carrier concentration, what type of carriers. But we are very curious about exactly is where, what the spatial distribution of charge carriers, and can you really direct to image that those things? Okay. So this one is two-dimensional mapping of electrical properties, potential electric field and charge density, as well as some kind of atomic configuration like ionic displacement and then any defects, even like oxygen vacancies. You can have a combination of really atomic structure by TN-based technique and combining this uh, holographic technique and the information about this kind of electrical information. Okay. So those two are really interesting as no one has done this uh, in this system. So we're going to try see what happens and so on. So the basic idea here, your LASTO, and the LASTO, you can build potential map and then voltage here, and then you can create electric field and convert to charge carrier density and then equations. So this is something you have. The way you do is actually use loose phase shift. Okay, you're making this different distance. Can construct this one. I'm not gonna go very details of this. 
when you have a different way of the plane and then image this, reconstruct this, you reconstruction of exit wave and you can create using this equation, exit wave equation, you can use all the information, charge carriers and then you have electric field and potential, we can do all constructors. Okay? This is published recently in Nature Nanotechnology this year in January. So I'll talk about the more detail later, I think, but this is a way you can actually see this. So, for example, we did a 3 unit cell and 10 unit cell, and below critical thickness here, and then this one supposed to be like an inch leading, because no 2D lacking gas. And above critical thickness or 10 unit cell, you, you, you should expect to see 2D electron gas. So when you do that, you charge a mapping here, and then here, the LAO, 3 unit cell, and you do not see any features here at AO. But when you go 10 unit cell, you see that here, red one, you see the charge density, you see the charge density at the interface here. Okay. So when you do this charge density mapping here, you can actually see this is the actual amount, and then you actually create this nominal interface here, and charge carry density is roughly 3 times 10 to the 14. Okay which is what roughly 0.5 electron per unit cell. And then the, f the width of this is roughly one nanometer. It's very, very small, uh, very closely confined to the interface. But this confinement, this one, is at the very close to the LAOST of what strontium titanate side. Okay? That means your strontium titanate, titanium plus four, is actually converted to titanium plus three, a titanium band. It's an electron to titanium. So, so that is, is directly can observe and 2D electron gas. But so recent paper we were talking about is when you grow this one in a different orientation and then your different orientation, you get very different width of this 2D, 2D electron gas and 100111. And that is due to actually the feeling of the band is different. Okay, so that's something we'll talk about today. So what he did here is interesting is people did a two electron gas only one zero zero. And then what we are interesting is what happens, different orientation of the interface. Okay. So far most of the people did a one oh oh interface, not the one zero zero. So this one 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 interface is interesting in many aspects. The first one, you look at this one 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 surface, the one 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 atomic configuration. Take a look at this, is when you cut this one 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 subunit cell, and this one forming strontium O3. Okay, one, two, three, three is strontium, and one strontium but oxygen three, so it's strontium O3. So strontium is plus two. Oxygen minus two, that means plus two, plus minus six, and that means minus four. Okay, so that means net charge here minus four. The next layer is titanium atom. Okay, no titanium oxide, titanium metal, which means Ti plus four. So that means your stacking sequence of the one 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 direction is minus 4, plus 4, minus 4, plus 4. So that means the polar. Okay? It's not, no longer non-polar, it's polar. But when you go length of aluminate here, length of aluminate, same problem, lanthanum and oxygen 3, and this one is plus 3, and this one is plus 6, then minus 6, so that means minus 3. And then you go next one, aluminum layer, the aluminum plus 3. So that means you're stacking sequence here, minus 4, plus 4, minus plus 4, and, and plus, minus 3, plus 3. So this we call polar polar interface, not non-polar polar interface, the polar polar interface. Okay? So this is a, something interesting and an observation. When you did the alternative stacking, and polarity is different, and reconstruction of this is predicted. But the you know in 
one of important motivation going to one 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 interface. One one interface is people start to realize when you look at the one 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 surface, and then this one looks like very similar to graphene. Okay, the graphene is hexagonal lattice, and then this hexagonal lattice is this is actually strontium or titanium atoms. When you go next layer of this kind of hexagonal structure. When you're creating this hexagonal continuously, and then you have connected this one, upper layer and bottom layer, and forming graphene-like hexagonal lattice, which is we call buckled, buckled hexagonal lattice. Okay, buckled. We call this a buckled honeycomb structure. Okay, that's what we call buckled honeycomb structure, very similar to graphene. And because of this structure. A lot of people actually interested in and then calculating electronic structures. So this is the actual map we measured by synchrotron coherent Bragg rod analysis and two-dimensional or 3D cobra map. And the, what it does is you can actually measure the electron density of the two-dimensional surface. And when you measure two-dimensional one, and this is the actual, actual atoms here measured, like a titanium coordination, graphene like a titanium coordination. You can see this. You can actually connect this with honeycomb structure. Okay? This is a real image, real electron density memory image of the uh, uh, strontium titanate surface measured by synchrotron. Okay? This surface refraction. And then, so some of the people, have observed quite striking result from one 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 surface. Okay. One of the work is a uh, is a Switzerland the John Mark Triscons group, and then they use lanthanum nickelate and lanthanum manganate, and then uh, they used manganese and nickel. When you grow these centrolums. One 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 and one zero zero. They made two different orientations. One zero zero, one one one. They made superlattices. They made a very beautiful superlattice by sputtering. That's why the first day, a couple, the first day, I mentioned that sputtering technique. They used a beautiful superlattice using affix sputtering. Okay. So that means very simple way. Your two sputter guns, lanthanum manganate, lanthanum nickelate. Just alternatively, they can deposit it. They make a one zero zero one 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 super lattices. They found that they see only th those are not ferromagnetic systems. Okay, the ferromagnetic system. And then when you deposit these super lattices one zero zero, you have no exchange bias. But you see only one one one, you have exchange bias. So that means your interfacial magnetism. Is plays a role, and then that's why. And this one is in 2012. You can actually see read the paper. It's a quite interesting. Just simple change of orientation of different interface superlattices can make a huge difference. And another one is this lanthanum paramagnetic and lanthanum manganese interferometer superlattice on one one one, and they show the induced ferromagnetism and the interface due to ferromagnetic lanthanum. That that's what they observe. But some other thing is, is people start predicting topological insulator behavior in one 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 system. Okay, so this is D. Shaw's group, and the University of uh, 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 Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and then strontium iridate. I know there's some students here working on strontium ruthenate, strontium iridate, and then making strontium iridate and strontium titanate. Using bilayer, like a, this, as I said, the buckled honeycomb structure. Remember, so when you're creating buckled honeycomb structure of bilayers of strontium iridate and strontium titanate, and then when you create the interface with a one-one-one direction, and then they expect a topological injury. Okay, so that's what some theory predictions in this system. They predicted not only this strontium iridate. They also predict the lanthanum gold oxide, which is very hard to synthesize. And then uh, because it's thermodynamically not very stable, only way you can synthesize 
lanthanum gold oxide, only one paper I found is grown by hydrothermal process, okay, which is a bulk synthesis okay, in Germany. And then lanthanum synthesis will be very difficult because it's oxidizing gold is a lot more challenging than, than EGDM. Okay? So I think there's some theory predictions, okay, predict interesting materials, but experimentally cannot really make those materials. So it's a, we are more interested in is a thermodynamically or even is a metastable phase you can form by epitaxial stabilization. But a lot of other material systems and predictive by theory is it, it, not possible to grow. But this system is, is turned out to be is possible to grow. And then we have been working on this, but the, 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 the their prediction is this front immediate has to be cubic perovskite. Okay, I think I, as I mentioned in the beginning, strontium iridate in bulk, bulk phase is, is a monoclinic phase, non perovskite structure. And then the prediction is, is a perovskite structure. So we have recently we have a paper about stabilizing perovskite structure, ultra thin, 111. Uh, Maybe a few bilayers you can grow, but beyond, it actually go back to monoclinic structure. So I think there's a epitaxial stabilization limited only few bilayers, like a, maybe uh, less than and one nanometer or something. So DFT calculations and then a one one one, and then we did work with the, um, the DFT person. You can see that six bilayers. The bilayer means is a is not unicell. Okay, definition of one 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 is a little different. In one 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 bilayers means is uh, this is the bilayer. This is a bilayer. Okay. This is a bilayer. You see that? Okay, this is a bilayer. We don't call this a unicell. Unicell is a, this is a unicell height like a four angstrom, roughly three point nine angstrom. And this bilayer one strontium oxide three one titanium. Those bilayers is diagonal direction one one third of the body diagonal direction. You understand that? The body diagonal direction, you have a three bilayers can stack in. So that means this is actual lengthwise one third of square to three and lattice parameter. Okay, that's roughly 2.2 angstrom rather than 4 angstrom. Okay, so that's a 2.2 angstrom and 2.3 angstrom. And then this is a 4 angstrom roughly. And uh, so that's the bilayers here. And you have a six bilayers, and you eight bilayers. You have a critical thickness of this is based on bilayers, not actual thickness based on uh, the unicell. And you expect the metallic strontium titanate and conductivity through the titanium site. You actually see that here. Critical thickness roughly eight unicell. So we grow this material, and then on the one one one. The challenge here, one 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 growth, is I think I mentioned in the first day, a lot of thin film growth, you place surface energy. Do you remember that surface energy? The surface energy placed is a layer by layer growth and then island growth. You remember this thing? I mentioned that water droplet on the oil paper, the oil and water, so that makes a different thing. And also in the uh, salt crystal, I mentioned salt crystal, like the different facets. And then uh, in perovskite, the lowest surface energy between one 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 zero zero surface. That's why one zero zero growth you can get very nice facet. Okay. So that means when you grow normally, normally you grow strontium titanate the perovskite on one 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 direction, then you end up the facets one all facets. Okay. The one all facets is looks like it's not growth growth front is one 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 which means the one 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 plane is like this, rather than this. You understand that? Okay. So that means when you grow one one one, you grow a lot of triangular shape. It's a surface rock. The rocks, like rock and mountain shape, like this facet. Okay, a lot of those. So it's no longer smooth, which means this kind of facet, you cannot make a 2D electron gas or a very nice interface. It's rock. But Thermodynamics plays a role at very high temperature. Okay. 
when you go high temperature, this is you, you have more important term, is energy term, surface energy term is more important. So when you grow this one at high temperature, you get this kind of okay. But you have another energy term here. You can use epitaxial actually energy, epitaxial growth. And then your epitaxial growth makes this surface overcome the surface energy, make the surface smooth. In order to do that, you have to go quite low temperature. Okay? If you go low temperature, its surface energy is not dominant, and then your kinetics is not easy to overcome. So you have a lot of time to actually nucleate and going. So when you go low temperature growth, surface very flat. Okay? If you go too low temperature, it forms amorphous. So you don't have those amorphous layer, but you have to go low temperature enough, then you can get smooth surface. You go too high in rough. So what you have found that temperature around the 500 degrees C, 550, and that, that temperature range, you get very nice epitaxy, but it grows very smooth, and then it doesn't form the, the uh, um, doesn't form the uh, uh, the uh, amorphous layer. But you can actually see very nice oscillation. Okay, this single oscillation corresponds to the one bilayer. Okay? Remember the bilayer? Okay, the bilayer. And then you can see the nice oscillation. And this is lanthanum aluminate. You can see beautiful step structure. It does not form this facet. It grows atomically flat interfaces. So we have these kind of interfaces from here to here. So that means you can make a very nice interface. And this cross-sectional TM ensures lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate. You see quite nice interface. And you see 100111. This is a actually titanium metal. The termination of this is a titanium metal termination, not the strontium O3 termination. It's a titanium metal termination. And next layer is lanthanum O3. Next layer, aluminum, lanthanum O3, aluminum. You can see the stacking sequence. And growth unit, growth is basically building as a bilayer. These two layers, is a bilayer, creating one oscillation. And another layer, another layer. So you have basically roughly 2.2 angstrom of this bilayer. That's a building block in one or one one orientation. Okay. So the read oscillation, one bilayer is aluminum at AO3 in all cases. Each bilayer identical, okay, shift the parallel to interface. And then this is what we observe. So as I said, the you know, prediction here is you have a critical thickness is roughly eight bilayers based on this DF calculation. And this is basically the same thing what the electronic construction and then what is the potential and you can calculate is a layer by layer DOS. And then you see real measurement, transport measurement is, is a seven unit cell, and suddenly you go up to conducting interface. Okay? So this is a below seven bilayers is insulating, but above seven bilayers you get the conducting. So this is a critical thickness is consistent with the calculation. And then it's consistent with the reformed 2D electron gas in this state. Okay? And then based on this uh, actual calculation, electronic construction forms a 2D electron gas. So quite interesting here, when you measure this electronic interfaces, 3-unit cell is, as I said, 100, 3-unit cell, and 10-unit cell. You see that no 2D electron gas below critical thickness. Do you remember that? That's it? Okay. The bilayer is a uh, four unit cell is a critical thickness. And then so below critical thickness, no two electron gas. But above critical thickness, you get two electron gas. You see that clear. Okay. For one one one, twenty bilayers, okay, but one 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 direction, you see that much broader, much broader two D electron gas rather than sharp to the electron gas. Okay? So that's something very curious why 
this one is broad, why this is narrow. Okay. So those things actually coming is measure is coming from really some inner diffusion or some other structural thing or that is purely electronic reconstruction point of view. So when you look at actual width of the interface, this is the actual electron density of the strontium titanate alto aluminate just interface. You measure the interface, actual width of the interface, both STO100111. You have interface width almost identical. Okay? So structurally, structurally interface sharpness is identical, but electronic interface is much broader. Somehow this one relates to band feeling. Okay, so it's something. So that's what we will talk about. So we have this is all in situ systems, and then you measure this, and then. But this one, I'm going to talk about the later, and then uh, something about how this one one and one zero interface plays a role, and then I'm going to talk after the break. Okay, so we have about roughly uh, 15 minutes. We talk, and then uh, I want to take some questions. Before then, I'll give a little bit of the background, the glazer notation. Some student is interested in glazer notation. So before I go to break, I will talk about this. But I want to stop it here. Then I'm going to go 111. And also, I'm going to talk about 2D whole gas, which is a very interesting science. And then uh, we can talk. So any questions about uh, this oxide interfaces? Do you understand this electronic reconstructions? Okay, so then I'm going to show you here some glazer notations. Okay, some student is interested in it's a yeah glazer notation. Interface, uh, how, uh, what was the deposition temperature? For deposition temperature? Yeah, you okay. said that you have to go low temperature for atomically flat surfaces. There's uh, two different recipes people use. Okay. One recipe called um, the uh, traditional use, use, like the original group of people. Uh, Theod Wang and then and Geneva Group and then uh, like uh, Max Planck, they use they use the gross temperature around 780 degrees Celsius at 10 to minus 6 torr of oxygen, low oxygen partial pressure, and very high temperature. Okay. And then after that's one zero zero, not one one one. The one 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 doesn't work at that. The one zero zero at that high temperature. So when they grow, the high temperature. And then a problem of that growing high temperature, what do you expect? 10 to minus 6 and high temperature, what do you expect? SQ should become conducting. SQ should become conducting without oxygen. Okay, that's right. It forms a lot of oxygen vacancies. Okay. The oxygen vacancies is a strontium titan it is creating a lot of oxygen vacancy heated up in, in, in vacuum. Okay. So after grow, strontium titan is conducting. Then just cool down to room temperature, you measure this. You are not only measuring 2D electron gas due to electron reconstruction. You have also measured conductivity come from oxygen vacancies. So that's why you measure conductivity, is conductivity very high. And then the bulk conduction, coming from bulk conduction. So in order to reduce this, and they do cool down and around the 600 degrees C. And then oxygen annealing for hour, very long period of time. So vent oxygen close to atmospheric pressure, then leave it there hour. And the reason they use 600 degrees C, you have a competing factor two of those, this annealing, because this is important for a lot of people should know. You have a competing factor. If you go very high temperature, then you have an equilibrium vacancy concentration increase. Okay, you know this equation, right? Okay. Exponential activation energy or formation energy and KT. 
And that's why when you go higher temperature, you go, even though you have same pressure of oxygen, even one atmospheric pressure, have you played this? Like you put it in your, your strontium titanium on top of the heater block, and it atmospheric pressure, heat it up, high temperature. Did you notice that color changes? Anybody see it? Color changes yellow. Change color yellow. And then because oxygen vacancy concentration, oxygen vacancy concentration increase with, with temperature. So when you go high temperature, you get more. Okay? Even though you're same pressure of oxygen. But when you low temperature, you get less. But Another competing factor is oxygen diffusion, the kinetics. If you go low temperature, your oxygen diffusion is very slow. So what that means is, if you go, okay, I want to annihilate 200 degrees C. Okay, the 200 degrees C, maybe vacancy, vacancy, equilibrium vacancy concentration low, but oxygen atom, this oxygen diffusion into strontium titanate takes forever. So. That's why you have um, like optimum temperature, it's roughly 600 degrees C. You have enough, I mean, the kinetic energy, you have a kinetic, you have a thermal energy to overcome the, this kind of kinetic barrier for oxygen diffusing. And then hold it like an hour, then you cool down, the, like a natural cooling down to room temperature. But leave it for a long time. That's one way to do it. We also use a different technique. We grow the films roughly 10 to minus 3 or 10 to minus 2. Quite high oxygen pressure, pressure at low temperature, like a 550 degrees Celsius. So we call two different recipes. And then when you grow low temperature, and then you have a lot of oxygen, and then you don't have to do extensive post annealing, like a grown 10 to minus 6 tall at high temperature. And then end result is very similar. The end result is 2D electron gas carry concentration is roughly 10 to the 13, a few times 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14. And then your behavior is very similar. Still we see that a lot of superconductivity and everything. But when you grow 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, you have to do quite different way. You have to grow 550. There's no choice. If you go 780, and then you surface grow. Any questions about this? Yeah. The superconductivity here in 2 is this, I think, at millikelvin? That's right, 200 millikelvin. So how it will be useful for the application? No application for interview right now. And then uh, I think it's a, it's a fundamental science interest, like a two-dimensional superconductivity, and that's what they are interested in. And a lot of, lot of superconductivity work, people doing it. It's not necessarily, as I said, not necessarily use that superconductivity for real application. For example, the discovery of 2D superconductivity, interfacial superconductivity in the ion selenide monolayer. Okay. Monolayer ion selenide on strontium titanate and transient temperature is a, like, roughly 50 Kelvin or 60 Kelvin. So, I mean, the original paper claimed 100 Kelvin, but I think. Uh, they have a hard time to, to reproduce. And then, uh, so 50 Kelvin superconductor, one monolayer, is it useful for real application right now? No, but I think that's an important science point of view. And then what is the mechanism for inducing the superconductivity? That is the idea to maybe tune some other things. They find the superconductor different ways. And mechanism is also a pairing mechanism. So it's a, it's a, a low temperature, like a, when they, what they did, they make a dome shape. Okay, when you're gating, by gating, there's a maximum, okay, like a, like a, like a, what is a carrier concentration versus. So they make a dome. Dome is like a 250 whatever Kelvin, millikelvin. <coughs> that's super. So it's, it's not like a, it's like a room temperature super, or high temperature. Any other things? Okay, so after break, we talk about the, some other questions we had, why we didn't see 2D whole gas, we only see the 2D electron gas, about the 14 years of question, and then now you understand this, and I'll talk about that. 
But before I take a break, and some students ask me about this grave notation, so I'll, I'll so this is a whole lot of metals when I talk, and then um, this is a, so the additional degree of freedom, the structural degree of freedom we have. <coughs> so A, B, and C, the three principal axes. This is actually greater notation. Zero, 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 zero means you have no rotation at all. Okay? So this is a, is a perfect cubic structure. This octahedra is perfectly like a position of the. But this is a minus means. Okay? Minus, you see that? Okay? This is a C direction. You see, along the C direction, your octahedra, this one and next one, we call out of phase. Okay. Out of phase means you have one going this way, the other going the other direction. So you see these two out of phase. Can you see that? Okay. So this octahedra and, and bottom next octahedra is out of phase. Okay. So that's why you call notation is minus notation. And then plus notation is in phase rotation. It's the same rotation. The rotation pattern is the same rotation. So the plus notation. Okay? But this is not only C direction. It happens A direction. It happens B direction. And then your A, B, and C, if all three degree of freedom, it can be plus, minus, zero. You have a three ways you can create. Right? So this one, this crystal structure, A0, A0, C plus. And this one A0, A0, C minus. Okay? So that's a laser notation of three principal axis rotational pattern, either or a tilt pattern, either we call in phase or out of phase. Okay? So in here, just want to clarify, <coughs> this is I don't know why they did that way, but that's their notation. A and B direction we call tilt. Okay? A B we call tilt. C direction we call rotation. I mean, same thing, right? Same rotation, also and same tilt. But they call it tilt, tilting and rotation. So A, B, tilt, and C, rotation. You have this kind of notation of minus is out of phase, plus in phase. So when you do this, tilting, tilting, I think this is a rotation. Sorry, I think it's the same. So you have a a or B and C, you're creating this kind of structure. So simply looking here, A minus, A minus, A minus C plus. Okay? So here, A minus, A minus C plus. And then you have the structure here, L tilting along the pseudo cubic axis, the A direction. So the A direction is here, okay? tilting here. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's hard to see that. So the L tilting, okay, so it, it, it should not move this. So this one, A tilting have, and the B direction is tilting, but this minus, minus, and then C direction is plus. So you have a, so plus direction in phase, this direction is plus, and A, B is minus. So this is, sorry, this is moving like this. But you look at the tilt patterns, or rotational patterns, and which way, bottom and top one is same direction or this direction and the other direction. Sa here, same thing. Go here and go that way or both going that way. Okay, with respect to this. But right next to each other, this one go that way and this one go that way. So you have a, you're tilting, you side next to one, the, both are in phase that direction, it goes like this, okay? And then this direction. So you have this rotation, but the, the next one is in phase, out of phase. So you're creating patterns like a minus, minus zero, or for example, one radial phase like lanthanum aluminate, tilt pattern is minus, minus, minus. Okay? All minus, minus, minus means all out of phase. Okay? And then this orthorhombic structure is so minus, minus, plus. And then that is orthorhombic PVNM, it's, it's, a, it's crystal structure form. So it is, you can have a laser notation, many, many notations, many, many structures, subgroup formation, but I talked about here just orthorhombic structure, minus, minus, plus, and then they can be 
controlled by subfade rotation pattern of minus, minus, minus. Because the length model is minus, minus, minus. And then material we are growing, polar metal is minus, minus, plus. The plus is trying to go that way, the minus going the other way. So we can turn it in the other direction, and that's what happened. Any more questions? That's correct. That's right. The zero means no rotation. And that uh, is uh, for the, uh, it is A, B, C, right? A, right. A, 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 if you are, there are three A's, like A0, zero, A0, zero, A0, zero, so that means there is no rotation in X direction or along Y direction or along Z direction. That's right. That means a cubic. Okay. Yeah. So is there anything called uh, A, A, A0, B, y, uh, B minus or C, something like this? You replace the uh, central uh, in the uh, y direction. You are uh, using a different uh, symbol. I don't. I think you can. You can actually go to original paper, grazer notation. So all possible combinations, existing one, and then you can actually see that the paper, original paper. So I don't remember all of those things, but some of them is allowed, some of them allowed, and then I think you can find those. But I think the fundamental basics here. This A, B, C direction, it can in phase, out of phase, or zero. So you have a combination of zero, plus, and minus, all three axes, creating variables of octahedral, and then it's a perovskite unit cell. And that creates what we call octahedral rotation, octahedral engineering. You can use a strain engineering one way, but your octahedral rotational engineering, that's why the PICO engineering, pico, pico engineering, because tilt here is not the nanometer scale, the picometer scale engineering. That's why it's tiny, tiny rotation and creating is a federal electricity and magnetism and then polar metals and it, all this new phenomena happens due to this octet rotation. And this octet rotation also creates a metal metal in transition because you have the overlaps of this and then you have a your angle is bigger, rotating and the angle is bigger, then your overlap is less. That's why you it's a variation tension. Any questions? Okay, let's take uh, some break. Then we can come back and then uh, we can talk about uh, 2D whole gas and then other things. And then uh, let's do that. Okay. feedback day, but we're just rescheduling it because tomorrow is a holiday. So those uh, who want to give the feedback, the forms are available, just fill it and give it to Paula. Tomorrow we won't have any class. Sir, we did it yesterday. Yesterday itself. Okay. One day ahead in time.
Azim Sagar, Amal Bharadwaj, Sanita, Sandeep Havala, Singh Yard. Mark of respect. Oh, okay. Ganesh, good job. I thought I have something here. <laughs> Vina Pratap Sandas, Minakshi, Gary Rutay Siddiqui, Shivani Chaudhary. Yes. 
Yes. Okay. All right. So we learned something about oxide interfaces, uh, two-dimensional electron gas, and uh, so I'm going to talk about here the puzzle for the last 14 years, and then uh, people was trying to make a 2D whole gas, and then it's a counterpart of 2D electron gas. So any um, devices, like a semiconductor device, you need the complementary uh, the uh, carriers, and P-type and N-type, and then they make the device interesting. But if you have only one side of carriers existed, a 2D electron gas. And then based on uh, electronic deconstruction model, and this one should form 2D electron gas, which is already demonstrated. And then this structure should form 2D whole gas based on electronic construction model. But surprisingly, anybody make this structure is insulated. Okay. The way they people made 2D whole gas is simply in here prepare the substrate, TiO determination, by etching of the uh, strontium titanate after annealing, and then after dip it in water, and remove all the strontium oxide, make a TiO2. And that is possible by etching. But the acide termination, strontium oxide termination, <coughs> cannot be done there. Okay. So the people did that, the approach they use is prepare first, Strong, uh, titanium oxide termination, then deposit one monolayer of strontium oxide okay, by deposition of strontium oxide by PLD or most of PLD. <coughs> but the question is, when you deposit one monolayer strontium oxide, and then a lot of questions, if. Okay, if we deposit one monolayer, does it really form uniform coverage, one monolayer, and everywhere, and as good as the TI determination? And that's one question. And then when you deposit it, how you control exactly one monolayer of strontium oxide? Because most ideally, you want to have nature, nature control. Your termination is better, rather than artificially you're trying to put it in, and especially is a strontium oxide when you deposit it. People use a read oscillation. Okay, but when you read the oscillation, one monolayer, one oscillation, it's not necessarily is exactly one monolayer strontium oxide. It can be, you know, the strontium oxide unit cell is a rock salt structure. The bilayer strontium oxide can be a building block. We do not know. So there's a lot of if question. And then they did that. So this is a strontium oxide layer inserted and then did it. A lot of groups did that, but this insulated. So, so what we did here is, is a kind of different approach. Let's use this rather than depositing one monolayer, and nature controls this. If nature can control it, then you don't have to worry about one monolayer to each termination. Okay, so let's look at the sequence of here. You start with the TiO determination here, then first layer, okay, lanthanum and aluminum, here's the TiO2, and the lanthanum, aluminum, lanthanum, aluminum, lanthanum, okay, and the lanthanum, right? Okay, get it? And aluminum, and the lanthanum, and the aluminum, okay? You ended up aluminum, the reason as I said, the 
growth of the perovskite by PLD providing two different cations at the same time, the building block is not monolayer of this layer. The building block is a unicell. The unicell building block, when you have a termination of titanium, building block is this is building block. So strontium titanate, the titanium termination, lambdum aluminate unicell, building block is this one, this one, this one, and that one, it ends up aluminum termination. Okay? It ends up aluminum termination. Then you deposit strontium titanate, and then what is the first layer? Because this is a B site, okay? And next one is an A site, okay? The sequence of growth, A site, B site, A site, B site. So the first layer should be strontium oxide. And next one is titanium oxide, and strontium and titanium. So this layer is exactly the same structure as this, but inverted structure, okay? Inverted structure, but you have this inverted structure, looks like here, and then 2D whole gas, and this region, you expect the 2D electron gas. So in the same heterostructure, you have a two different carriers and two different interfaces. Okay? And then the, the problem, people, you are not the only one you try, some people try this, and then with a very thin, they didn't see it either. Okay? Very difficult to see isolated measurement of this one, isolated measurement of that one. Can you separate it? You can see 2D electron gas, 2D whole gas. Is a measurement is very challenging, and then also detecting is very challenging. <coughs> but more importantly, the reason they didn't see that is a very fundamental problem of this. So P time interface, so why is insulated? Okay? And then one of the hypotheses of the insulating is whenever you have polar field and the top surface, let the eliminate here, you always have small amount of oxygen vacancies. Okay? These oxygen vacancies compensate oxygen <coughs> polar field and prevent formation of 2D whole gas. That's one of the hypotheses. Okay? So we look at this calculation, like a DFD calculation here, and the, the time interface, if you have this kind of 2D electron gas here and 2D whole gas, and without oxygen vacancy, and with the oxygen vacancy, you have a quite different band structure. And you have an electron here, you have a no oxygen vacancy, you have a whole gas forms here, density of state. And then with oxygen vacancy, all the holes are removed here. Okay. So that means you have, even though you can create this structure, you don't want to have any oxygen vacancy here. Okay. Okay, that's the key. The oxygen vacancy is a really killer. So what we did here, depositing this laser MD, but nice thing about the PLD here, you know that we can grow thin films up to one tor of oxygen, which is quite high, with the in-situ weight. And doing so, you have resoscillation of strontium titanate and grow, start with a strontium titanate substrate and grow at AO, number of oscillation length of aluminate. This is, this is exactly one unit cell. The reason we are able to see the oscillation, this will grow layer by layer not step low, not this, uh, the uh, island growth, and you end up and stop it here, then grow STO again. Okay? So STO definitely grows very nicely. So this one is grown very high oxygen partial pressure, 10 to minus 2 torque. I think somebody asked questions about your growth condition, and then uh, most of people grow this one 10 to minus 6 torque of, of quite high and low oxygen partial pressure. Once you form the low oxygen partial pressure forming oxygen vacancies, <coughs> and very hard to remove it once you, that oxygen vacancy compensate in the polar field. Okay? So we want, we want to, at the growth condition, we do not want oxygen vacancies formed. And that's the only way we can prevent this uh, compensation. 
So we saw 10 to minus 2 tall, and then we were able to grow by PLDDs. And then this is the actual structure we measured by TM, and this is a call coherent rag rod analysis. It's the same thing, synchrotron based technique, surface diffraction. And the technique this one allows is so you can see <coughs> the this is a time interface. We actually image that two different images. We look at the, this interface and look at the, this interface, we look at the both interfaces. But this interface is all well studied. So we know what the termination, what the width of the surface, what the crystalline quality, we all know. But we are more interested in this surface. Two questions. Number one, this interface really what expected strontium and aluminum termination. Number two, this interface is oxygen vacancy is low. Okay, those two. So when you do it, when you look at this one <coughs> and the TM image, and this one both TM image stem, because stem image, like a scanning transmission electron microscope image, and this, this heavier atoms is a brighter, and lighter atoms are like a darker. There's a, the Z, it's a Z contrast image. <coughs> you can see here interface, this one is regions of this one, aluminum here, lanthanum, and this aluminum, and next one, strontium and titanium. You can see that. And then this, uh, this image here, okay, maybe I have to change this battery. Okay, so you see, looking this interface, and then this elemental mapping, EVS mapping, uh, electro, uh, energy dispersed with spectroscopy in the atomic scale, and then they said, okay, here is a termination is clearly what expected, but more clearly, you can see the surface diffraction is clearly lanthanum, aluminum, and strontium, titanium. You can see that very nice termination. <laughs> This can be imaged by, by coherent background rod analysis. It's a, it's a technique is to allow you to do electron density mapping. And the nice thing about this one is, is actually very clearly see that like what kind of electron density. It's not really telling what kind of atom it is, but electron density mapping. So this one elemental mapping based on like EVS mapping, but you see three-dimensional coherent background analysis, we can see that. So now we confirm that time interface is really strontium terminated surface. Okay? So the challenge here, after you grow, you have to measure it. Okay? You want to measure the transport measurement is very, very challenging because those two are separated like a time and body. So the, the, you can actually see that here, bottom interface electron gas and time interface to the whole gas, we want to measure both. You know, to measure both, you have to cut these regions, make a context on this corner here. Okay? Expose this, make this full context, measure this top interface, and measure the bottom one, measure the bottom interface at the same time. No one has done this one, but I think it's, it's, it's tricky, it's very hard to make ion milling and then very carefully do it. Because uh, ion milling also creates oxygen vacancies and oxygen vacancies to also making conducting path. When you do this, you measure top interface and bottom interface. One of the very distinct characteristics of this one, your slope of a hole measurement. Hole measurement shows electron, electron gas, the bottom interface, negative slope and time interface with positive slope. Okay. So this is directly we can transport, measure this to the gas, whole gas to the electron gas. Okay. So we see, we confirm this,
But surprisingly, to the whole gas, the hole is heavier. You all know, hole is heavy, and the electron lighter and effective mass is different. Somehow, when you measure this, it's not much different to electron gas and hole gas. And uh, this is something quite interesting. Why this thing happens? And the electron has a much stronger interaction, phonon interaction. Electron phonon interaction much stronger than hole. And that's what the theorists actually have some ideas. Maybe that's the reason electron hole gas. It's already, to the electron gas, is already very low mobility at room temperature, like a five and low temperature, a few thousand. And then, but the strong electron phonon interaction. And then, and you see here, the temperature dependence is very similar, so it's a very highly mobile and 2D hole gas in the system. So another way I mentioned that we have a technique, electron, the inline holograph technique to image 2D electron gas with the spatial distribution you measure, right? Remember that I talked about? So we can use the same technique to image the 2D hole gas, 2D electron gas at the same time. So holographic technique can measure type of charge because you have a electron has a phase shift to that direction, whole phase shift the other direction. So your phase shift is different. So from this phase shift, and you know the hole and the electrons. So when you look at this whole gas, electron gas image, and the bottom interface looks like electron gas, red one, and top interface is a hole gas from the top. So you can see both electron and holes can be observed in the same structure. So that's a direct imaging of 2D hole gas and electron gas. Okay, so quite surprisingly, we see both. And the carrier concentration here, I mean, the spread here is more than this, but the more important is sign is consistent with this one. Okay, now, this is a very, very difficult to convince the community because they were trying to work 14 years and then everybody said, oh, that's not going to work. And you need evidence, more than one evidence. That's why we spend a lot of time in writing this one. If, if, if almost this work took four years, start from actually publishing papers and uh, more than four years to do that. And then, uh, because we have data, but we need to one extra data to really directly show the evidence. But that's not all. But still we have one missing piece. Do you know what's the missing piece? <coughs> Anybody idea what the, okay, this is done. Can you do that? But we, this is not enough. So maybe you can see, oh, okay, you have this. You can actually write a paper with a 2D, 2D whole gas, we can write it. But we want to do additional direct imaging to see that. Is it enough or you want to do more? What is missing? I think I want to ask a question is, this is enough for you to write a paper or report or not? You have one missing piece here, you know, for understanding of science here and the why people didn't see 2D whole gas is because oxygen vacancies, right? So we have to show some evidence here. <coughs> we do not have oxygen vacancies and then that's the one thing we'd like to check. So the, the here, how do you actually image or detect oxygen vacancy there? The technique we call is depth to resolve the cathode luminescence measurement, the spectroscopy measurement. And this technique is measure the defect state. <coughs> okay? So you have defect transition, cathode luminescence measurement. But the way they do is depth to resolution, they measure the depth profiling by changing uh, the energy here. And then they actually determine the spectra here, photon energy versus, and then the different uh, like a thickness region, like 0.5 nanometer, 8 nanometer, 14 nanometer, you have a, this a depth, okay, this a top STO and this a bottom in FSTO. You measure this, 
by four Catholic innocents. This is a, a mid gap state. A mid gap state, you are facing a transition, and that's what you do. <coughs> From this measurement, your elect oxygen vacancy concentration is oxygen vacancy. Is can you can index the all the peaks where this one coming from, okay? And then recently we have other paper is working with the hybrid functional theory, and then calculating what is the defect state forming what kind of mid gap state. So we know exactly what the mid gap state, what the transition. Then we can index all these defect state in capital luminescence measurement. Okay, that's very important too. So, so we know which one actually we can see what energy peak we have. So from this, you quantitatively measure the oxygen vacancy concentration across the sample. Okay, across the sample. This is really surprising. You see that this region here is strontium titanium substrate. This region, lanthanum aluminate layer. This one is on top STO. You grow top STO, grow on 10 to minus 2 total oxygen partial pressure. The oxygen, oxygen concentration, this is oxygen vacancy concentration, you know, vacancy index, extremely low. Even lower than box single crystal. Okay? Even lower than box single crystal is very, very low. That's why your oxygen vacancy cannot compensate this polar field to kill the, the two divorces. And this one also explained the other way around. Why people didn't see two the whole gas just growing on top of here, just the one monolayer strontium oxide, and grow LAO. And somehow, <laughs> substrate has a more oxygen, concentra oxygen vacancy concentration, the films grown by this PLD at 10 minus 2 tall. Okay? And then, Maybe that's the one indication, but or maybe a strontium oxide may not be covered quite well, or strontium oxide quality bad, or some other reasons, extrinsic reasons. But this is a, at least we can explain this original hypothesis, what I show. This diagram. With oxygen vacancies, in this one, you cannot have a 2D gold gas, but without oxygen vacancy, you can have 2D gold gas. And that is very consistent with what observed in here, and the cathode medicines clearly shows this. Okay? So that opens up is a two things, and the reason I'm telling you here is, is a, this is a very simple demonstration of 2D whole gas. And then I give you several okay, lessons from this. Number one, okay, you know, to demonstrate this, I think uh, it's not easy to convince the community because of people is, didn't see that for many, many years. And they're trying to give many, many reasons try to not to believe our data. So when you present this one in the paper, in referees or, or talks, they want to argue counter-argument, all possible counter-arguments say, no, that's not right. Okay? In order to convince this, it's extremely difficult because you have a, people say the conventional like wisdom, like that, this is right. Everybody believes that way. Then you have to overcome those things. I need a lot of like a, evidence to believe. It's not only data. They want to have additional data plus. You have to explain mechanism. Is really makes sense. Okay, that's why it took a long time to write this paper and write this one. <coughs> this one just came out in January 2018, but we start this one is many many years, and then. And then each, each step, we are asking questions. Is really this is happening? And go back to theories to calculate again. Okay. And go back to surface X-ray diffraction, make sure that titanium strontium termination. And then we want to make sure that image it, 
to have a more than one evidence of 2D electron gas or 2D hole gas. That's why we spent another year, two years to do the imaging of the inline holography imaging, those two. It's not trivial, very difficult to task of this. So the message here I'm trying to, to say is, is when you have doing some science work here, and then it's the best, easiest way to convince this, you want to show direct evidence. Okay? The direct evidence is you want to show, directly show transport measurement. You say the 2D whole gas, and some papers previously mentioning, oh, we see the IV curve or whole measurement when you do that, looks like nonlinear behavior. Okay? It's not straight line, nonlinear behavior. So that means nonlinear behavior, they use some calculation of whole and electron equation together. Okay, there's some component electrons, some component in the, I, the, the holes. That's why the behavior looks like something there. That's the one way you can convince people. But that is not really direct proof of something. But nonlinear can be many other reasons too. Okay? But that's the one way people convince. That's enough to do that. But you want to show one positive slope, one negative slope, very clear slope difference. That, and then also measure all this independent top and bottom measure. That's one way. And also, you want to, people want to see exactly whole gas there, electron gas. That's why we use the technique, holography technique, to image it. But that's not enough. You want to show our original idea or, or mechanism. And mechanism is elect the oxygen vacancies. So you want to do oxygen vacancy concentration mapping through the thickness. So that is the important lesson I'm trying to share. And then it's easier to, to, to convince for direct evidence. So what originally we have a paper is, is not named like direct the final paper of this uh, published one, direct observation of two-dimensional whole gas and oxide interface. It's the final title of the paper. Actually, we submit the paper, original title is, do you know what the original title was? 2D whole gas and oxide interface. That's our title. Very simple. That's a short title. It's when, you, when you have a publishing papers like this, you want to have, it's a shorter, it's better than long title. There are some people like a long title, but I think you, you have to short and then like is is a point you want to make. So we have to simple just one line to the whole gas and oxide interface. That's one. But editor changed the title after we accepted the paper. And editor suggested direct observation, edit those things because uh, they want to. They, they, they see this paper is much more attractive because of direct observation rather than <coughs> just the claiming or indirect one. So that's what the change of title and published later. So that's what I want to share. And then maybe not everybody working on the same kind of oxide interfaces. But I want to share uh, some of the examples of this can be applied some other things. So now we have a 2D whole gas and 2D electron gas, we have a both. Then you have a counterpart those two. Then you have a lot of possibility of using those two and open up some other physics experiment and device experiment and uh, those things uh, possibility. <coughs> and then and that's why we are very excited about this and people is, is so the, the one of the, uh, <coughs> the, the editor actually contacted people to write the commentary like news and views. Do you know what the news and views is that when you do? The, when you publish papers in the, in the uh, journals, if the paper is interesting <coughs> to community, then editor contact experts in the field, ask them to write about this paper. So this is also honor of, of the person who write the commentary. Okay. This is called News and Views, and written by the Nini uh, priest at the, uh, Denmark, DTU, and then uh, 
he wrote, and he's a, he's a scientist, I mean, he's a two people, wrote this comment uh, to the whole gas scene, that's the title of this. And uh, actually, <coughs> our polar metal paper, the Nature one, also the editor contacted the person to write the news and views. Because news and views is about is a, what is the implication, of why important, what direction is it going. I think they say something. So they wrote those things in the same journal, uh, same issue. They write, publish the paper, then they publish news and views, which is uh, two of them. So people can see the paper, they see the news and views, read it. There's a news and views much more general, more like a more public, more general public to read the community, and then you can actually see that. So, so I think that's something is 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 an editor's point of view. This one is so interesting for the community, so they want to have input from experts in the in. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll send those things and then I'll, and then later you guys. But uh, so I'll, I think one possible uh, question here. I don't have those things. I have something like potentially, and then this 2D whole gas, 2 electron gas, it's a, a sandwich, those things. What possible directions it can go? I think a, we have to mention something and then a pair of those. But I just want to have a very simple example of demonstration of 2D whole gas and then in counterpart of 2D electron gas. I want to stop it here and then take some questions. And now I'm going to go other part of like a more practical. Pra if I give it, here, here are things. If I elect to the electron gas oxide interface, it's lots of interesting papers. And then probably you guys are overwhelming, giving so many lectures in two weeks <coughs> time frame. Okay, so I think it's a better to. I, my my goal is is. Dumping all so many things, I think you have a strong, like a message of hurting approach of science, and then some field, like an overview of the field, and then I think that's what I want to emphasize. But I want to take a more discussion from now and then before your lunch, then uh, we can have this afternoon, uh, after lunch, I'm going to cover some thin film deposition more practical. So that you learn all the basics, and then you have some materials to through your study. Can you really simple building, and then or making samples to to test your ideas? Okay. Any questions about this? Yes. Sir, uh, what is the critical thickness for 2D whole gas formation? 2D whole gas, the critical thickness of it. We. Um, the critical thickness we measured, we cannot really test it. The problem is, your random eliminate critical thickness gets smaller and smaller, like a three <coughs> cell. They short it out. Your critical thickness is random eliminate critical thickness, right? Not area of significance. So the way we tested the critical thickness is you have to be two, two layers has to be separation. If it's only three in itself. Then surely now you cannot measure. So you have a starting thinnest one, it's like a 40 unit cell to minimum without any shortage. And then you go 40 unit cell, 80 unit cell, we can do thicker ones or, or shows this. But you cannot go less than 40, 3 unit cell. It's uh, impossible to measure. But this is a more practical reason we cannot do that. Uh, this is the only technique to see this oxygen vacancy or from experience. Okay, XPS, uh, I don't know what other techniques oxygen vacancy can do, but the, the reason we picked this technique, 
this one is depth resolution. You, you can you can you can, add depth, can you can actually measure the depth exactly where oxygen vacancy is. XPS is a surface sensitive measurement. You cannot really do depth resolution. So that's the one we do. <coughs> and then uh, the person we uh, we collaborate, he's a really expert of defect characterization. It's not only this, some other defects, like uh, what can I defects, any things. But in here, we did, I mean, some other tech, you know, work we are working on, like titanium anti-site. Remember that, the one talked about titanium goes to strontium site? We did that work too. We have published, we submitted the paper. And that work includes include that uh, a calculation of like what is the, the, the mitigate state we calculated. And then we determined that intensity. So we have the, those data. But we thought this is the best <laughs> bet and to, to determine it and the depth resolution and the more quantitatively. You have any better idea than better technique than uh, I mean, you can do more than one technique measure, one measure. Yes? I think in the sense you were talking about titanium oxide termination, strontium oxide termination selectively. So how can we achieve it practically? Like when we are depositing the films, how can we do that? How can you do that? Uh -huh. How can you make a strontium and titanium termination? Uh -huh. Okay. So bottom interface here, bottom interface, let me just go to this. Okay, bottom interface here. That is technique first day I mentioned. Okay, so think about this: with titanium oxide and strontium oxide. And strontium oxide is more basic, and then titanium oxide. So the the way they did is the dip it stront, uh, the strontium titanium as a received okay, mixed determination, the DI water. And then sometimes just a DI water or DI water and then heat it up like a boiling DI water. Then that actually induced that the strontium oxide forming strontium hydroxide. Okay, strontium. And then once the strong hydroxide forms, and then the much easily etched by weak acid. So deep it in BHF etching, buffered hydrofluoric acid. And then remove all the strontium oxide, strontium hydroxide, and leave the TiO2. Okay, that's a standard technique, and people after look at this uh, termination of TiO2, and then what they did is uh, they call kaisis, the technique called the coaxial, I think it's the same technique, kaisis, ion scattering spectroscopy. Okay. Coaxial ion scattering spectroscopy then measured what the top surface at. The so most sensitive method, they actually use the angle, and what the surface layer. So they confirm what the top surface is a TiO2. Okay, that's what they did. So that is of the substrate you are speaking of? Substrate. So, so in the second layer, means uh, first that is so that's the second layer, top layer. The one we did is the strontium oxide. That is the that's the second layer. Okay. Okay. So that's the first layer. 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 Okay. So that's the first like a unicell by unicell, okay? Not the layer by layer. So one thing I want to emphasize here, when you grow this lanthanum aluminate, okay? You look at the one oscillation here, this oscillation. We look at the oscillation number of pers, number of pers or time looking at those. This one is exactly one unicell all the time, okay? You can calibrate this one by Reflectometry. Yesterday, remember I said, reflectometry you can measure. You grow hundred oscillation. Then after that, you measure uh, uh, reflectivity. Then you get the exactly what the thickness. We know what exactly one oscillation corresponds to. This one oscillation is exactly one unit cell. We know that. Okay. So that means this count oscillation. You stop it here. Once the oscillation has a stop it here. That is the termination of the one unit cell. The full coverage. Once you want full coverage, but this coverage is always happens as a unit cell by unit cell growth. Okay, because uh, this growth is uh, this is the building block. Remember that? The building block is <coughs> unit cell by unit cell. 
So once you start B termination, it ends up B termination. Except, except strontium ruthenate. Remember that strontium ruthenate I talked about? Do you remember what I talked about strontium ruthenate? Termination conversion, do you remember that strontium start from the titanium and then termination convert to strontium? Anybody remember? Don't remember? Okay, let me show you that one slide here. Do you remember this slide? Anybody remember this slide? This slide is shows first oscillation is 1.5 times a unit cell. And then here, each one unit cell, roughly 22 pulses based on reflectometry measurement. So we cannot really see unit cell by unit cell oscillation, but we know what is the rate. The rate is one unit cell of strontium ruthenate requires 22 pulses of laser. Okay. 22 pulses laser <coughs> grow one unit cell of strontium ruthenate. But somehow, one first oscillation is not 22 pulses, roughly 34 pulses. Which means this first oscillation is roughly 1.5 unit cell. Why that happen? Why you need more process? And that happens here starting with TIO determination and first the building block of growth, <coughs> one and a half in your cell, and transition of the strontium titanium termination to strontium termination. That's exactly what happened. First, first the building block, one and a half in your cell. Not the two in your cell, one unit cell. But once you form transition happens, strontium termination, then you continue to grow strontium termination. Okay. Then, you may ask a question to me then, well, why didn't you use, why didn't you use uh, this strontium, uh, the, uh, uh, you already converted to strontium termination. Okay? Then why don't you grow strontium titanium on top, grow LA on top, then you can do the same thing. Do you understand this logic? Okay, this logic. So we have, we thought about the same thing. We thought about this. Oh, okay. Here's strontium termination done. Okay, let's grow LAO, then grow STO. Uh, the, the, the LAO, grow grow here, STO, grow LAO. You can do that. Okay, that's easy. But if you're doing so, and then your structure is is very complicated, and you underneath, you have a conducting electrode bottom bottom layer is conducting material, the metallic oxide. So it's, it's, it's a measurement wise, it's, a, it's, a, it's very challenging because it has, it has underlying conducting layer. So we decide not to do this way. We decide to use inverted structure rather than doing this. Do you remember this? Do you remember this diagram? Anybody remember? Okay. Go ahead. To Can you speak up a little? So 22 pulses of laser corresponds to one unit cell growing that. How we do like, like optimization of our film by that we can understand? Or is there any uh, theoretical or mathematical way to calculate that? Calculate uh, this number of pulses? Huh, that corresponds to one monolayer. One monolayer. Okay. So this is all experimental. It's empirical, not uh, theoretical at all. And uh, okay, here is something maybe you are interested in the or the growth perspective. Why we pick 22 persons? Why we pick 22 persons growing one unit cell? Not, why not 100? Why whole 5? 
You can ask this question, right? There's a this fundamental question. The growth is a lot of complex equation. And then you can have the when you grow this atomic layer by layer growth, you have a lot of consideration of many different factors. One, you want to grow layer by layer growth. You need enough time to atom surface diffusion to form the layer by layer growth. Okay? So if you grow too fast, the atom lay down too fast, before your atoms go to the top around the island, it lay down on top of island making <coughs> birthday cake. Do you know what the birthday cake? One, 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 not birthday, wedding cake. The wedding cake is bigger, right? Wedding cake big, another one, a multi-layer wedding cake. You don't want to make a wedding cake, you want to make a pancake. One layer pancake, flat. And then this one requires you slow that position, otherwise you lay another nucleus on top. Okay. That's what, number one. Uh, this one, depending on two factors. One factor is temperature, okay. your substrate temperature. Your substrate temperature is you go high, then you get faster deposition. Still, you have enough you know, thermal energy high enough. Surface diffusion is fast. You can go easily, go to the edge, and then you can grow. But you cannot grow too high. If you go too high temperature, then you have atoms actually doesn't attach here and dissolve. Okay? If it's a, energy is too high, then you just go away. This is called sticking coefficient does not stick, it go away. The other factor you have to consider is the terrace length. Okay? Your terrace is huge, terrace is narrow. Okay? If the terrace is long, then you're more likely forming multi-island here. And then so the biscuit is an important factor too. So you want to do the miscut angle, that's why I said miscut angle has to be very well controlled. And then other factor, is oxygen partial pressure. If you use oxygen partial pressure, it's this common thing in, in, in oxide growth. If oxygen partial pressure is high, then your mobility is slow. Okay? The reason is you are more likely forms in gas phase suboxide. Because oxygen is so much, <coughs> your incoming species is either cluster or it can be suboxide. Once you form the suboxide, your diffusion is slow. So it's ideally most effective way to grow this fast growth and then it's a grow atom, oxygen coming in attached to when you form the crystal structure. That's the highest way, best way to do. You understand? So your strontium titanate will grow, strontium atom comes down and find the strontium position, but still you have to oxidize it. Oxygen coming in, go there, that's the best way. But you form the gas phase, you have like a strontium titanate or forms, then you go down, it's already crystallized, and it doesn't <coughs> like to be that way, stuck there. So it's, it's so when you, the thumb of rule is when you grow oxide, when you grow oxide at high oxygen partial pressure, in general, you have to increase temperature. Okay? You have to increase temperature. And if you go low oxygen partial pressure, you can do low temperature. So even same material, you can grow 550, although in 900. And then you grow the approach what I said, just pure metal source with the, like ozone or atomic oxygen provided by MBE, you can grow 500, 600 degrees. You grow very high oxygen partial pressure, dumping a lot of oxygen partial pressure, fast growth, you grow crystalline quality, good one, need a 900 degrees Celsius. We have a wide range of temperature. Does that answer? Any more questions? Okay. So, 
So this is the termination conversion I talked about, like a, <coughs> another approach. And then uh, maybe we can stop it here. And then uh, uh, let, let me. Okay, so hold on, I just to. Do you want to break now or come back later, or you want to continue a little more and then come back? Which one you prefer? Continue. Continue is better. So I'm going to talk about some fundamentals of <coughs> pendulum deposition. Uh, yeah. Uh, in PMD, sometimes with some target, it happens that initially while depositing the plume is of this shape, it is perfect. But it, uh, while depositing the film, like if 200 nanometer I'm depositing, the plume shape changes, and sometimes it's like very small or it just vanishes kind of when we see from outside from the chamber. So it will affect the growth also and Absolutely. Uh, it's not a good thing and how, to, not how good. to control it. That's right, not good. You have to you have to make sure your plume is not necessarily exactly monitoring things, but it's indirectly plume has to be is uniform uh, over the time of growth. The the reason you get the plume is coming very different initially and later your target condition changes over time. And then sometimes certain targets reaching out certain element. So especially a strontium, uh, like an iridate example, iridium is reach out much faster, and then later is a target surface is uh, almost like a rare earth left. And then, and then, then you grow material, the first initial material very much uh, iridium rich, Later is iridium poor. So, if that happens, you have to take the target out and you have to grind it. And then, when you grind your target, and then more importantly, your target, you want to have a more dense target. If the density is low, you more likely have more severe problem of this. And then, uh, then I think you are also like a laser, you have to make sure the laser intensity. Is, is optimum, it's not too high, because it's too high and then you can make a trenches so easily. So make your trenches, then your plume is, is the plume shape is like some cosine now. So it can be more like this, more like this, it can change. And this change, you know, also depending on pressure too. Pressure is low pressure and high pressure, and low pressure is, is much more like a holistic, and high pressure more scattered, yeah. If we polish it every time, before deposition, so it will change the growth rate also. We have fixed our growth rate like one inch from per second. We have optimized it for a particular thickness. Okay, so usually when you grind your target, okay, this is a practical thing. When you grind the target, you don't use first round, you don't deposit. So first round, maybe scan one round, and this is called pre-ovulation. You do pre-ovulation to make a condition in your surface. When do you pre-ovulation, then after the deposit. Okay, so because when you grind it, maybe the surface has some junk on it, and you grind the powders. So if it's a nice to have a pre-conditioning, then you deposit. It depends on your target. So for example, when you have a, ideally best way to do is if you can get single crystal target. The single crystal target is uh, most ideal. But sometimes you can use a single crystal. For example, you have very wide band to get material. You have NGO, okay, magnesium oxide and sapphire. You cannot use single crystal. Do you know why? Two forty eight UV, completely transparent. Okay, completely transparent, no absorption. There's no absorption, then you cannot operate it. Okay, so it's like anything your band gap is is huge, like a magnesium oxide sapphire. You have to use a ceramic target. Okay, ceramic target. You have a you have a absorption is is coming from all the grain boundaries, and then but this, if you have is opaque, it's basically opaque in ceramics, but single crystal is not opaque. So you can do lanthanum aluminate roughly five eV, and strontium titanium three point I mean, two or five eV, 
those things you can do PLD with a 248 nanometer excimer laser. But if you go like a seven or nine or like a large, I mean wide band gap, then then you cannot do. <coughs> okay, so uh, let me just talk about <coughs> some of the. Anybody done evaporation here? Anybody done evaporation? Anybody do some evaporation? Anybody done uh, sputtering here? Okay, so I'm going to do something some basics of this and then maybe useful to to later how to you actually build your system to to make your uh, needs. The reason I talk about these two techniques is maybe something very easily um, you can adapt and use it and uh, in the lab. I think MBE is uh, definitely a very controllable, nice technique, but it needs a lot of effort to build and then a very high cost of it, high maintenance, and then long training time. Uh, so the, let's talk about the evaporation here. So in evaporation, and then everybody know this one, this phase diagram? And this phase diagram is chemistry around this chemistry. So what kind of phase diagram is this? Anybody have an idea what phase diagram? Immediately you can see that this phase diagram, what it is. Anybody have? Chemistry around this, right? Water. water. How do you know this water? Triple point existence. Water? How do you know water? Just a triple point? This slope. This slope tells water. Okay. This slope is positive slope like this. This is not water. This water. That's why you can do ice skating. Real ice skating. You don't do chemistry. Okay. Physical chemistry on this one, right? The reason you can do ice skating, you will pressure it. You pressure, then high pressure, you can lower the melting point. Uh, lower the melting point. That makes the water water underneath, and that's why you get the ice skating. And then when you, you you never have this issue here in in, in the New Delhi, but Wisconsin we have winter and water pipe can burst because when it freeze water expands. Okay? But other metals, when you freeze, volume shrink. Okay? So this is slope is tells those phase diagram. So this T P phase diagram and that's the that's the one. Okay? That's what all you on the chemistry and the physical chemistry on, right? This this phase diagram. And then uh, the evaporation is liquid to gas phase transition. That's the vapor pressure we get. Okay? This vapor pressure is, is over liquid is given by this kind of equation, so enthalpy of evaporation. Okay? That is something. So most of evaporation use this kind of diagram. Okay? Anybody use this diagram for your evaporation? Anybody use it? Raise your hand. Anybody use this? No? Haven't used that? Okay. This is based on ex experimental empirical data, but also you can actually make this one calculation based on thermodynamic data. Okay. Thermodynamic data is you know that the uh, free energy of okay, dP dt. Okay. You remember this uh, dP dt call like a dP dt. Delta S, delta V, you remember this, this equation over, anybody remember? Okay. This equation, you can actually calculate what the vapor pressure as a function of temperature. Okay. As a function of temperature, this one basically function of temperature is the vapor pressure. Okay. You look at the vapor pressure of this different element, lead, or like all the different, you can actually find all this, this one from the website, or you can ask the uh, vendors, like any evaporating like uh, sources they buy, they provide this information. 
And this one tells what is the vapor pressure at what temperature. And then this one is tells what is the boiling point or sublimation point. Okay, boiling point is estimate pressure of the uh, vapor pressure. So normally, when you do your evaporation, and then you are here, what is the roughly what's the range of vapor pressure you need to deposit your thin fluid? In principle, you can use a 10 to minus 6 tor of vapor pressure to deposit thin films, but your rate is very, very slow. And then also, you're depending on your, your the background pressure, your base pressure. Your base pressure is 10 to minus 5. Okay, a lot of vacuum chamber is only 10 to minus 5 tor of vapor pressure. Then, your vapor pressure of the element, 10 to minus 7, then what do you expect? Your impingement of this gas, background pressure of gas, is more than your evaporating element. Okay? Which means you end up depositing, for example, I want to deposit titanium. Titanium vapor pressure 10 to minus 7, your base pressure 10 to minus 5, then what do you expect to deposit? You deposit TiO2. Because your impingement of the 20% of the background gas is hitting that the surface, you ended up all TiO2. It's, it's something that that's, that's, uh, tells you. So in order to overcome uh, those kind of things, you need a reasonably high vapor pressure. Okay? So that's a vapor pressure here. Normally people use 10 to minus 3 tor of vapor pressure in the evaporation. And then your base pressure greater than 10 to minus 6 tor of vapor, base pressure. So base pressure 10 to minus 6, and then your vapor pressure, I mean, base pressure 10 to minus 6 or better, and then your vapor pressure supposed to be 10 to minus 3 or better. Okay? So that is thumb of rule, rule of thumb. So okay, what temperature I want to deposit certain material? That depending on how fast you grow and what's your base pressure. And then when material is is more is reactive or less reactive, and you can do that. So here, okay, let's try 10 to minus 3 and draw the line and I know what the temperature. Okay. That's the first approximation. When you deposit like a alloys, I want to make alloys two elements like this. Okay, your element. Your flux, your flux, I want to make deposit 50% copper, 50% nickel. And you deposit this. And what's the temperature of this cell? What's the temperature of this cell? How do you know? You just empirically you do it, or use this diagram, and use the same kind of pressure, 10 to minus 3 tor, and draw the line, and you end up nickel, and nickel vapor pressure here, I draw the line, okay, the 1400 something degrees C, okay, I use that number. <coughs> and the copper, maybe copper somewhere here, I don't know where the copper is, maybe the nickel and copper should be low here. Okay. Okay. That's the chromium, that's the chromium. Okay, that's chromium, and the chromium is here, chromium, chromium nickel, and you use the chromium nickel, chromium is temperature like this. So that is the first approximation of those two sources. So use these three sources to grow, and then that's the alloy so you can grow. And one way you can go is alloy deposition, or you can do sequential deposition of those things. So evaporation is rate, depending on impingement rate, is how many flux is determined by the pressure. Okay. This pressure is coming from this. Okay. So you know what the rate, and basically you can calculate this. And then your measurement of the QCM, a crystal ray monitor, okay, you use a crystal monitor, when you grow it, you stick in QCM, and calibrate it, and remove it, you deposit it. But QCM is the one way to do it, but I think it's always you want to check the thickness, the physical thickness, using reflecti uh, uh, reflectivity, 
or alpha step, and those kind of independent measurements to make sure calculate. So that position is is a lot of factors you use, but the deposition of the the evaporation is cosine law. Okay, cosine. So your your rate is basically is constant over here. Okay, the cosine is constant. So you have here you deposit flat, quite flat surface of the substrate, your thickness variation over here. Okay? So ideally you can make a curved, you can curved substrate, then you get uniform thickness, but you cannot make a curved one. So your distance, for the distance you get the better uniformity. But I don't think you have any issue for most of your deposition because your sample size is quite small. Okay? Your sample size is quite small, your evaporation your distance is a that much distance, you have no, no issue. Okay? So that's what you do. And the deposition rate okay, depending on this pressure here and then all the equations. Okay? You plug in density of film and then you know what the net deposition rate given by the material properties of film and temperature and vapor pressure and geometry of deposition chamber. So one of the important aspects of your thin film rolls is step coverage. When you make some thin films and the pattern the devices, sometimes you make a pattern device, making something like a, a via, and then you make a context and all these things. This is a step coverage is one of the important aspects of thin film leverage. So for example, sometimes I want to deposit very uniform coverage of the steps. Sometimes I want to have a coverage of like this, and you have some difference of this coverage. And then this one controlled by the pressure. Because when you have the evaporation, is evaporation is a ultra high vacuum environment, and your flux is very much a ballistic. Okay? So I don't know, you guys have uh, seen this one. I think here you don't have a snow here, right? Do you get snow here? You never get snow. If you go mountain, you get snow. But then you snow, and you have a something steps, like a step like this. Okay, the steps. And you have seen this one quite a lot. Your snow coming without any wind blow at all. Very, very quiet day. Snow just fall down very gently, vertically. Okay, no wind blows. The snow coverage is only top of the steps. Okay? Only top of the step. And side wall, still I can see the concrete wall. I can see the concrete wall. Because uh, everything comes down gently from the vertical. <coughs> this is exactly what happens when you deposit evaporation or dry vacuum. It's ballistic process. All the atoms coming vertical. Well, but when you have wind blows, okay, is, uh, when the wind blows, then this coverage is covered like this, everywhere. Because snow is not coming only vertically, it's coming sideways too. Okay? So the, how we can make a sideways in the deposition, we can use a scattering. Because in vacuum, you cannot have wind. So you have an atomic species coming, scattered by other one, Scatter other one. So when you scatter, you can go all different direction. So <coughs> in order to deposit very uniform coverage, simply you increase the pressure. Okay? You increase the pressure, then you have a better coverage. What's the best example of increase the coverage, like a high pressure? So you can deposit almost atomic, one atomic pressure, like a CVD process. In CVD, you can deposit very complex structures. For example, you want to deposit like a cutting tools, like you know, drill bit. Do you know the drill bits? The drill bit is a very complicated structure. Uniform coverage of drill bit, if you just deposit in one way, you can have a shadow effect. You don't, you don't deposit the other side. So in order to do that, you have to grow very high pressure, like CVD process. But sometimes you want to do lift up technique. Anybody do lift up? For lithography, anybody done lift off? Do you know what the lift off? 
also lift up. Yeah, so lift off is an EV methodology with a lift off, especially metal, nano structures <coughs> with a lift off technique. What they mean lift off is okay, first you deposit the photo resist type of PMMA, okay, photo resist, and you actually pan on things and remove certain regions, and then you deposit metal and remove the other pieces. And then you have some regions you left. I think it, maybe I have to draw something. I don't have those things. In order to lift up, you need a side wall has to be exposed. Otherwise, your the solvent cannot go underneath of these layers. Okay, your forages you have to attack this. You have to lift up. In order to do that, your coverage has to be very poor. You have a similar coverage like a snow cover only top of the stem, not the side wall. The side wall exposed and then your solvent can go side wall and then lift off. You know what I'm saying? So depending on what kind of usage of your thin film deposition and you have to use high pressure process, sometimes you have low pressure process. For example you lift off, you have to use evaporation. If you sputtering and then usually sputtering is the pressure is higher because you have argon gas in the background. You're covered and very hard to remove it. So what kind of technique to use deposit metal? Um, I generally use evaporation <coughs> or sputtering. Okay. If you use a sputtering, you have to use a low pressure. If you go the mean free pass, you know the mean free pass, how far you can travel? And mean free pass depending on pressure. So make sure, depending what kind of need, and you have to control the pressure of this. So that is something, step coverage. And then many ways you can deposit evaporation, but simple method you can do, even just the premium metals and the filament or boat, you can do many different ways. And then more controllable way, you can use an effusion cell. An effusion cell is very deep and then orifice some our size and heat it up and then control the flux. And this effusion cell is, is quite expensive too. I mean easily can go one effusion cell and then MBE, easily $25,000 just to one effusion cell without much of other things. So, so it, sometimes you do not need, if you do not have a really well controlled process, and then is infusion cell without it, you can use a simple bolt. Okay. The other source you can do is EV evaporation. And the EV evaporation is, is because of this thermal source, you cannot go higher temperature because of your tungsten filament it heat the substrate, it heat the source. And then in order to overcome this, for example, your tungsten the ceramic material, sapphire, still can evaporate it and using the EV evaporation. Okay? EV evaporation is basically using filament and generating electrons. An electron beam can be focused by magnetic field and melted, but around here, water cooled copper crucible. Okay? So then you have puddles here, and then that's the source of it. So that's the evaporation. <coughs> so EV evaporation is is one way, no limitation. Example, refractive metals you can do, and then you can do uh, some element, you can do thermal evaporation, and some element you can do even evaporation. Okay, I think this is all you know. A ray monitor using Koch crystal monitor you use, and then and the thickness calibration using this. And sputter deposition is one of the widely used techniques of sputtering. Okay, it's it's a commercially and then lab scale. And then, but there are two different types of the sputtering. Do you know why it's a DCA RF? 
When do you use RF? Okay, no the RF is an insulating material and GC is a conducting material. A lot of uh, oxide materials is like in between. In between, not, not fully insulating, not conducting. So you can use both. Okay? DC or RF, you can go either way. But your pure metals, is DC is preferred. If you want to deposit nitride, okay, I know some uh, you are growing nitride. In nitride deposition, we use metal type not the nitride type. And that is a much more uh, faster deposition and more efficient. And then in nitride, you can use a PLD too. Some people use a nitride ceramic target. And nitride ceramic can be sintered and then use a PLD. But sintering process, nitride can be contaminated. You press it, oxide forms, it's a very, uh, not a very clean process. So, best way to do good nitride, buy a metal target. So if we did a chromium nitride, a manganese nitride, we have different nitride, titanium nitride, use a metal target. And then, nice thing about the sputtering, you cannot grow good nitride by evaporation. Because if nitrogen, molecular nitrogen, it's not very effective for, for reaction because of this is a reactive, reactive process. So people use uh, the crack, crack this uh, nitrogen, it's atomic nitrogen. You need an atomic nitrogen source to grow a nitride, like a, like a gallon nitride grows, they use some cracked one, or cracking, uh, like uh, ammonia cracking. But the uh, sputtering is, is a plasma itself, itself it dissociates nitrogen to enough ions in, and atomic nitrogen. So if that's why is sputtering is so powerful, the reactive sputtering. What you all doing in oxide or nitride, the reactive sputtering, not the sputtering like a metal sputtering. Okay? So we have reactive sputtering. But you use a ceramic target, it's already reacted. So you're providing the flux from this but still you additional gas and then provide additional source of oxygen or additional source of oxygen to stabilize it. So you have more than what you have a target provide certain material system. And certain material system is a target itself is enough to, like when you grow sapphire, target is enough to provide. Lithium bearing carbon dioxide, target is not enough. You have to provide more oxygen. So you have, depending on how much oxygen you need, you have to provide this additional oxygen. But nitride, you start in metal, nit metal target, and you provide nitrogen, molecular nitrogen, and then that dissociate, and then provide nitrogen, we call reactive uh, nitrogen, <coughs> reactive sputtering. So here, you have the sputtering, you have a DC and RF, but you can use most of metals DC, but RF is a little bit tricky in RF. And then when you grow RF, make sure. And how many use the RF sputtering here? Okay, so do you use RF sputtering? Is so you have a power supply, your tuning box. Do you have a tuning box? Okay, tuning box? No? Do you know what the tuning box? Okay, your RF, RF, RF power supply. DC is a very simple, one box came in, and DC is a plug-in, and then you can read the voltage and then current, and you can look at the power, and then you can just increase the power, that's it. And of RF sputtering, you need a matching box, like a tuning box. And inside of the tuning box, they have a variable register, variable capacitor, so they have a, like a matching the impedance. Okay, matching the impedance, because of your RF plasma, some kind of conductance, say RF plasma. So you have to match the impedance to minimize the reflective power. Okay, so when you look at the uh, RF, uh, RF uh, power supply unit, you see the forward power, the reflective power. Okay, you have a two. Anybody tune this? 
<coughs> have you done that? So you have an automatic, you have a, like, a, sometimes you manually match it. So usually, it's, a, it's RF, you have like a matching box, it's your tuning, of, you have like a tuning impedance of tuning, and then you have a, sometimes automatic tuning cannot find the real minimum. So your tuning is a multiple minimum like this, okay? And then ended up local minimum. So that means it's not real minimum. You have um, the refractive power still very high. <coughs> then you have to find the minimum, real minimum refractive power to maximize your input and then less amount of refractive power. So you have RF is not really using that uh, automatic one, but I think you can manually tune it. And then in, the, in RF, make sure when you buy this, the one thing people make is, your cable comes, right, the cable? Do you know what the cable length is? Cable length, you cannot cut the cable length, you cannot do that. The length of cable is a match to your 13.56 megahertz of your frequency. The 13.56 megahertz of the frequency is allowed, allowed because so you cannot use any frequency, then communication is messed up. You cannot do that. So that's a frequency allowed. And then for the, but for some, some new power is a small power, not an issue, but high power is, it can be an issue of interference. So your length of cable and tuning is all related to this. And then, you know, the spot training is a is basic process here, but when you reach that steady state, and then surface, surface stoichiometry is not, yeah, go ahead. So what is the reason of this fixing the 13.56 megahertz? Then in particular reason, or is that optimized frequency? You mean 13.56 megahertz? That's allowed by the, uh, I think in US it's FA, yeah, like a, they have a, like a communication. You can use this frequency, a given. And then you cannot, with all the, all the power supply, RF power supply can use only that frequency, which is allowed, only, only, only rule, regulation. And not necessarily, because your frequency is, the reason you are 13.56 megahertz. Um, RF sputtering is you have mobility of ion, a mobility electron, is not the same. Okay. So think about this way. Your frequency is, is low frequency, like 60 hertz or 100 hertz. Then your ions move back and forth, electron move back and forth. Okay. But electron is lighter, electron needs to vary like this, and ions is slow. So think about the slow one, is electron go here, ion go here, they're different different, right? Going back and forth, okay? Your frequency switch AC, because the AC is slow, this one going like this, okay? Then later, frequency faster and faster, and this one, frequency faster, this one, electron fellow this way, but ions, slow, cannot go this way. Do you know this, uh, what is that, like a, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, like a, like, like a, um, athletes, so going one side, the other side, going back and forth, tandem, what do you call? And then you go, one go faster like this, and the ion cannot go. So ion stuck in one direction. So that is the reason RF you can do, with dark space, you can, you can have those things. But the 13.5 megahertz is, is frequency high enough, you can separate the electron sign. <coughs> so I think I'm not going to talk about this one, but the, you have your this is the RF part, the discharge, this is diagram. And because of this electron positive potential, electrons result in a large electrical current, and negative potential attract the massive ions and result in a small ion current, because ions are low mobility, and electrons is a high mobility, and that's why you have this kind of ion curve, and excessive electron current in creating an ion current. So that's why, this amount of the uh, shift of this is what we call the self bias voltage. Your bias voltage, self bias voltage, that is the actual the uh, the uh, energy 
as the ions is hitting the surface. <coughs> and then this is the discharge, you can actually see the shift of this. This is a magnitude of self bias in this case, about the 5 volts, and it's always negative voltage. So when you look at your power supply, in the RF spot chain, you have a control parameters. One, make sure that you have a power of the whatever power you use, but read the bias voltage, self bias voltage, what the voltage is. But that is a very important factor of your energy of your incoming body. <coughs> okay. So the reason you the magnetic sputtering, you guys all magnetic sputtering or DC sputtering? Or magnetic sputtering? Okay, magnetic sputtering, there are two types of magnetic sputtering you can use. One is planar magnetic sputtering. I think you guys all use planar magnetic sputtering. And other types of magnetic sputtering people use is a hollow cathode magnetic sputtering, which is a, is a very attractive technique, but the target preparation is very difficult because you have to make a hollow, like a cylindrical shape of the target. And this hollow cathode one, so this uh, magnetron sputtering is basically increased the electron density, the ion density, because uh, your electron motion is, is spiral motion. So you have a chance of ionization of the argon increases significantly near the target without without actually increase the pressure of argon. Because uh, you have pressure is increased, then you get ion density high. But at the same time, your scattering <coughs> is too high, so you cannot reach that uh, your sputter species cannot reach the surface of your film. You all know this? Have you know this magnetic sputtering concept? Okay. So in order to do that, you increase the uh, ion density Around, around the, this target by spiral motion like this, this kind of spiral motion. So you can increase the, this scattering possibility, like a, like a impact ionization. Is increased impact ionization, then increase that. But those things is target surface. You have what kind of magnetic field you can create. So your spot to target, you take it out. You have a magnet most of your sputter source you purchase like a circular shape of thing. You have a, in the middle, you have a button type of magnet. And surrounding, you have a, like a donut shape magnet. So the creating magnetic field, old, and then people measure the magnetic field on the surface, how many gauss. And a lot of people made the mistake in the, in the uh, sputtering. Once you Sometimes I forget water flow in the heater. Anybody made a mistake? Okay. Not okay. flowing water into your spot again? cannot make that mistake. Can I make a mistake? Because uh, we have a switch there. Uh, uh, that's a... Uh, Low lock at the, uh, uh, the only inter... Only it switch, uh, that switch only uh, activates when water is flowing. Okay. Otherwise your DC power supply won't uh, okay. switch on. So interlock system. You have an interlock system. Interlock. And then sometimes student is to bypass the interlock system to, to do that. Then you end up, and the water doesn't go through uh, your target, and then your target just melt, and then you, you, it's a, like a disaster. Not only target melt, it demagnetizes your, your magnet. Once it demagnetizes a magnet, it's no longer magnet sputtering if that happens. So I think then one thing is, uh, is a trick. If you you are doing like a sputtering, you realize the water is not flowing, okay? Then what do you do? You realize that water is not flowing, and then some student turn water right away. Then what happened? Then you are <coughs> inside, you have a the sputter gun inside, a lot of ceramic insulators. Okay? If the solar shock, it cracks and water leaks. So when you have realized that is the sputter gun is not, I mean, water is not on, you realize too late, don't turn water. Just to shut off your power supply, wait, let it cool. <coughs> not, do not turn water on. That can be even worse than. Okay. So this one is the sputter guns. So you have a, 
your internal like a button magnet and then this uh, ring magnet and then you have a magnetic field and these regions you get the maximum amount of the uh, ions and that's why your erosion pattern of your target is here not the center not the edge some kind of erosion pattern around the ring those things in between the button magnet and then around the donor magnet Okay, so that is a, so when you do this sputter target in ceramic, uh, you guys use a sputtering target. How do you mount your sputtering target? Ceramic target, anybody? Just mount it directly on the heater block, or the sputter gun? There is a backing plate. Good. Do you use a backing plate or backing cup? Do you use a backing plate? Backing plate, okay. So, my recommendation of all you do sputtering, use a cup. Don't use a packing plate. The backing plate is good enough to hold this. Okay. Do you know what he's talking about, backing plate? You don't know? Okay. This is a very common trick of uh, <coughs> a ceramic target. You know, two problems. Number one, thermal conductivity is poor. Number two, ceramic target is very vulnerable to thermal shock. Okay? So when you sputter initially, therm temperature, room temperature, backside cooled by water, you dump power right away, your thermal shock cracks your target. You crack target, you're not holding anything, you just break it piece by piece. Once you break piece by piece, and then you have no longer uniform pattern of deposition. Okay? So in order to overcome this problem, because it, 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 it's, it's sputter it's gun here, your sputtering target is attached to here. But the role of this backside here, you have an anode here, okay, the cathode, the water cooled. So water cooling and cool the target. At the same time, this anode here it bias negative bias. So that attract ions, okay, argon ions. But this magnetic field, magnetic field actually induces the magnetic field to increase the ion density. Okay? But when you mount this, you have this one cold, but your target is very vulnerable, so you want to make copper. Copper has the best thermal conductor. Okay? So the people use indium bonding. The indium metal, the indium melting point is low. So indium and then your copper, you bond it together, make sure that good thermal contact. And at the same time, it holds, it holds very well, with preventing cracking. But the, the problem of the plate, you have a, some kind of expansion this way, and you don't have a holding side wall. So the ideally, Make your target inside a deep inside the cup. Do you know the cup? Okay. So the, you you make a cup. Your height of the cup is the total thickness of your target, which is roughly a quarter inch thick. Okay. The quarter inch total thickness, quarter inch thick. And then make a, this a dip of the cup, and the side wall is relatively small enough. And then you can cut it and then put it in indium or silver epoxy and then lay down inside. And then you cure this, then you can have um, the uh, not only thermal conductivity, you can hold it, and thermal expansion, you can hold it, but you also hold mechanically cramping. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's a very important. Then, then once you cure it, your target is good thermal conductivity mechanically well cramped. Then, then you can use it. Okay, so that's something. Ceramic target, I highly recommend doing that. Metal target, you don't have to do that. Even like a manganese or some of those metals, it easily can be shattered too. So you have to use the cups and then uh, that's the metal. So this is, the, as I said, cylindrical magnetic sputtering is, is another important technique. And cylindrical magnetic sputtering is, is a magnetic field is coming from is is a targeted sidewall, and then this technique is basically your 
flux is coming cylinder and then you deposit film underneath so flux is coming like this and then this technique is developed by the German group and then uh, you can buy target with a hollow cathode spotter gun but uh, the challenge is, is uh, making the, um, the uh, target is very very difficult very expensive so I think it's not widely used even though quality of film coming very nice so I don't want to stop it over at 1 o'clock here. I think we can break the time. Then um, maybe I can, rather than just a lecture, maybe get her together and then uh, some deposition, like a thin film deposition of how to set the vacuum chamber, maybe spend time, maybe after lunch. Then uh, anybody want to stay here, that's fine. If you want to leave, that's fine. doesn't need to be everybody here but anybody wants to talk about it and then we can spend maybe half an hour or one hour we can, we can have a discussion. Okay, any questions? ferromagnetic target like iron and cobalt or those kind of metals, the sputtering is harder. So you know to do the two things you can do. You do when you do magnetic spot magnetic magnetic material, your target thickness has to be very thin. So normally the standard target thickness is one eighth inch thick. Okay, one eighth inch is one point point one to five inch, one eighth inch thick. Usually magnetic material is half of the thickness, one sixteenth thick, the very thin. Okay? So then you have a two ways you can do. One, make a target thin, or you buy buy spider gun, stronger magnetic field. So it's a, you can they can ask the vendor, we are going to the magnetic magnetic material sputtering, can you provide magnet stronger than normal spider gun? So you have a two ways to do it. A simple way to do buying without new spider gun, order the target very thin. One sixteenth inch target rather than one eighth inch thick, the standard thickness. What thickness of target do you use? It's three mm. Three mm. Three millimeter? Three millimeter. So three millimeter is what? The point? You can calculate that one. But the th I can calculate the inch. <laughs> okay, let's take a break and then I'll come back again. Okay. Is that good? Okay. You don't have to stay here this afternoon if you want to leave. And, uh, but then if you are interested in uh, discussing.